Uh, I brought you some snow this morning. Yeah. Y'all yeah. dry here? Yeah. Yeah. We're extremely dry. Northwest Oklahoma, uh, Leedy, Oklahoma, actually, is where I'm from. Uh, we're in that about 20 inch rainfall, give or take 20 inches. Uh, you know, in 2011, we had uh, 9.3, in 12, we had 7. Uh, in 14, we had 25.3, I think, or 24.3 in the month of May. So literally, we can be give or take our annual rainfall. And that's what we're seeing uh, in this world uh, right now is uh, whiplash weather. Uh, I was very blessed to be a part of the previous administration for USDA, and I've done a lot of work with the climate hubs uh, across the Southern Plains region. And, uh, the whiplash weather term has come up, and, and basically I think it fits us pretty well because uh, we can go from flash drought to major drought to flash flood, heavy snow, very cold, February last year, 20 below zero at home. We've never been 20 below zero, never want to go back there again. So, you know, how do we uh, function and farms and ranches in extreme weather. And it doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm not in the debate of what's causing it, but you know, weather's always changed uh, in years past for far as we can go back. We know that we have wet periods, we have dry periods. Uh, we've been very blessed in the past here to be through a, a kind of a wet period. And sadly, looks like we're kind of in a dry period now. So the talk I'm going to do this morning is uh, came uh, last year. Uh, the High Plains Journal asked me to do a, a program for them, uh, and they wanted the state of our soil, kind of like the State of the Union address that the president uh, would do. And that really came from years and years ago. The first presidential uh, address was to, after the war, uh, to give a state of the union where we're at. And so this whole talk is going to wrap around uh, where we're at in soil and, and resiliency. So, you know, innovation builds resiliency in farm and ranches. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. You know, fear. We, we, there's two big definitions for fear. It has two means. Forget everything and run. Yeah, a lot of people do that. Or face everything and rise. I chose to rise because I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to give up. I'm, I'm just stubborn. Well, my family prefers strong will. But. <laughs> so if you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid, Keith. You know, we've, we've all thought that as we started this wild journey and, uh, you know, that's the way uh, a lot of my friends and neighbors have, have laughed at me and talked about what we've been trying to do for the last 10 years on our farm and ranch. Uh, I grew up uh, in a very clean till cotton wheat farm. We, I set a mini hour on the home board, uh, 40, 20, four bottom plow. Uh, my junior year, uh, there was some soil bank land that my dad had rented in 1960, the year that I was born. Uh, the, the older gentleman had passed away. He, he vowed never to plow that land again. Well, when the kids got it, and some of them were in California and all over the, the country by then, uh, they wanted to break it out to increase their revenue. My dad refused to plow the plots by the cemetery down there because uh, the, the gentleman, Roy Walton, that my dad had leased from, he, dad couldn't plow that by the cemetery. So uh, I've done a lot of that in years past. So the state of our soil, where are we at? You know, and why should we care what the state of our soil is? You know, when I grew up, uh, I never thought of things like I do today. Like, what's the biology below? You know, what's my soil organic matter? How much carbon do I have in the soil? Didn't think about that. 
you know, we're going to look at where we began. We're also going to look where we are now. You know, and where can we go? Can we do regeneration or are we going to stay on the path of degradation? You know, sadly, uh, worldwide, not just here in the United States, we took some of the most fertile ground uh, that was here and, and we've actually degraded it down. We, we mined out the organic matter and the carbon. You know, there, there's a lot of talk about carbon markets nowadays. Uh, you'll hear some of that later on today. If you were going to filter your water, Brittany, at the sink at the house, what kind of filter would you put on that? Yeah, carbon filter. What you got to think about was, you know, God put carbon in the soil to start with. Now as we talk about water quality, nitrates, phosphorus in our aquifers, part of that reason is we took the carbon filter out of the soil. I've never, never thought about that years ago. But how does that work? The principles of soil health, and I really like Noble Research. They've done a lot of good work with us and Brittany and John as well at the farm. Mimic, don't fight Mother Nature. You know, I, I've been fighting Mother Nature all these years and didn't even realize that. You know, uh, it's, it's something that we need to think about. Keep the soil surface covered. Have you ever noticed if you plow the land for very long, weeds start coming? You plow, more weeds come. It's that Mother Nature saying, I don't want to be bare and naked. I don't want to be cold. I don't want to be hot. Let's keep it covered. Also, minimize soil disturbance and stress. I, I'm a no-till farmer now. But every once in a while, I have to do a little maintenance. We have feral hogs at home. They don't till very even. And so I have to do a little bit, but minimize disturbance and stress. You know, why should we worry about stress on the soil? Well, if you're the soil microbiology and you're working in the top three to six inches, four inches, and you're, you know, you've got your little community and you're feeding along on the roots and the exudates coming out and here comes this gigantic tractor and disc or plow or whatever we're pulling, it's like a tornado going through the community. Something we need to think about. Increase plant diversity. Why, why would we do that? I want to raise wheat. I want to raise corn. I want to raise beans. If you look around, Mother Nature doesn't do mono. If you looked at the native prairie, anywhere from 100 to 500 plants in one setting, one place, a community, much like here in town. Something that we need to think about. Maximize root growth. Why, why worry about that? Well, first of all, we all know the more roots you have below the ground, the better the crop, whatever you're growing is above ground. But also, them roots are leaking exudates that feeds the biology that turns loose the nutrients from minerals to make your crop grow. Something to think about. And properly integrate livestock and diversity. Livestock was part of the original plan. On the prairie through here, there was hundreds of species of animals feeding on the prairie. It really likes that. So, pre-sediment, soil organic matter. This is a big debate, but somewhere between three and seven percent in this area through the southern plains. Some will say it's higher than that, some will say it's low. Where I'm at in western Oklahoma, they think we're probably in that three to four. Away from there, it's better. What did that look like? Looked a lot like this. Through the winter, the bison still came through. In the summer, very green, very lush. Lots of diversity, lots of flowers, lots of trees in the background, even though the prairie was limited on trees, they were still here. So, Rain follows the plow. 
You know, the government, we're here to help you. I worked for the government before. I always laughed about that when I went into the offices. You know, I'm here from the government. I'm going to help you. Everybody just laughed. The government put this out, trying to help settlement. And boy, did it. It started to fall on it right down the hill. Still does it today. Here in the corner, what's that? That's the moon. Where the astronauts put the flag up on the moon. Anybody remember that? I just barely do, but I, I do remember that. Look what we've managed to do. Looks kind of similar. You know, my granddad was never so excited when he got the first planter that he could ride. So he didn't have to walk behind the horse. You know, he, uh, he said, you never will understand how true farming is till you walk behind a horse all day, son. You need to appreciate that. But this is what we started and done, and, and this is when it began. Now, I want to stress that my granddad, your granddad's, great granddad's, all these generations never intended to degrade the land. They loved it just as much as we did and do. But now we've learned a little better. But then come the tractor. My granddad said, oh my gosh, he said, you can't imagine what we could do when we got the first F-20. He said, man, that thing was a power wagon. My lawnmower's got more horsepower than an F-20. <laughs> you know, things have really changed. But as I look at that picture nowadays, I'm thinking, holy cow, what would happen if we'd get a four-inch rain? Right straight up and down the hill. So. Soil erosion from water. You know, in the 30s, in Oklahoma, uh, we all had a lot of dust erosion through here as well, too, in the west. But actually, in Oklahoma, we lost more soil in the 30s to water erosion than we did dust erosion. Because when it did rain in big rains, it went right down the hill. Huge amounts huge amounts. Lincoln County, Oklahoma is number one Woohoo! in the most degraded, most soil loss in the nation. Cotton, cotton, cotton. No residue, no residue. Right down the hill. And I done, you know what we would have done when I was growing up to that? We would plow them in, this cat over, hair that over, and got her level back up. And not until a few years ago, I had a friend that had something like this happen. And I said, oh my gosh, Kevin. He said, yeah, i got to get that filled up, smoothed up. He said, dang ditches. And I said, it's not the ditch, it's the problem. He said, what are you talking about? I said, it's what was in the ditch is the problem. You don't have it no more. It's gone. Then here we come with the terrace. We're going to fix that. You know, and I, I worked with NRCS. I, I'm great partners with NRCS. Soil Conservation Service come out, and we fixed the problem. We stopped the ditches. We just diverted the water out of the field. We never thought about, let's keep it in the field. You know, how could we keep it in the field? That's what I work on now, is trying to keep it in the field. But it was a good solution for the problem at the time. And they still have a place. But then, you know, here come that thing rolling down the plains. How many of y'all have experienced some big winds here this year? I had friends in Kansas and Colorado, 109 miles an hour. A hurricane is only 75 miles an hour and up. It's like, wow. And guess what happened? Black Friday on May 31st. May 12th of 1934, 200 million tons of soil. 200 million tons of soil in one day. What a deal. Granddad talked about this. He said, you just can't imagine the amount of dust in the air and in the house you had to deal with. This is a famous picture out in Oklahoma Panhandle. They still got that plot marked off. It looks a lot different nowadays. 
up trees around it, the green grass. But wow. Then, how are we going to fix the wind erosion? Let's build a shelter belt. Worked great. Once again, we were thinking differently. We didn't think about keeping the land covered itself. Let's continue what we're going to do, but let's just put a shelter belt in and protect it behind, which, once again, was a good solution to the problem at the time. I'm, I'm not criticizing what they've done. I'm just saying we weren't thinking the big picture. We had took the cover out of the land, done what we wanted to do, and then we had a problem. Instead of fixing the problem back where it was, we done something different. Just something to think about. So then, here come this thing. We went through the 30s. Now my dad's farming. And this thing in the 50s come. And what was it? Huh, another dust bowl. These are pictures from Texas. We'd learned so much from the 30s that it continued. It was like, wow. You know, these guys were doing the best they could do, but overall, we weren't really looking at the context of how to really fix the big picture. Looks like white snow. Big white sand. Then my granddad got into modern agriculture. I still have that tractor, by the way. Man, that A. John Deere. God, I love that tractor. Man, what a power horse over an F-20. My granddad actually had the first rubber tire tractor in the county. Modern technology, he said. Wow. You know, but so that was actually granddad's last tractor. He used that up till he retired. And like I said, we still have it. But then my dad come along. 3020s and 4020s. Now you talking about a power wagon. They could pull a four bottom plow. Four mile an hour. Wow, we're doing good. And then we got this thing called cab and air conditioner. You know, I got in one of them the other day at a friend's house. My oh, gosh, that thing's loud inside. <laughs> it seemed so quiet back then. You could hear the radio a quarter mile away, but you couldn't hear it in the cab. <laughs> then my dad stepped up. This was his last tractor. I lost my dad in, in 1997 to cancer, blood clots. I had this tractor up until uh, uh, two years ago, I guess. We had a big wildfire in 2018. It was 300,000 acres in our county. Uh, burned us half out. Uh, lost several landlords' houses. We lost a shop, 25, 23 miles of fence laying flat on the ground. And then we, we got to deal with NRCS and woody debris removal, so all the dead trees we've been grinding and mulching. I had this tractor sitting in the barn. I hate to let it go. I also need some equipment to mulch the trees, so I uh, sold that tractor and got something. Then I come along, <laughs> and we're going to plow in tall cotton, four-wheel drive, 200-some horsepower. Wow. We were really cooking. Now we have 380 horsepower. You know what I do with that tractor? I pull an air seeder with it. I was going to trade it off and get me a front wheel assist. It was paid for, 9330, nice tractor. You know what's going to cost me money to get a smaller tractor? Hmm, it's paid for. Let's just use it. So what does that all mean in the big picture of Emmons Farms? The bigger the horsepower got faster, the degradation started accelerating. Granddad couldn't plow all the land he owned because he couldn't walk behind the horse fast enough. He didn't have enough horsepower. But man, I fixed that. I plowed places he never thought about plowing. You know, he used one horsepower to 25 in his lifetime. My dad started with 25 and wound up with 160. You know, I went from 25, I started at age 9, put my first crop in, to 380. So, what has that done in the big picture of our soil? 
2019, a series of strong storms hit Pennsylvania. Now, they have done a lot of work in the Chesapeake Bay, and they have made great, huge strides in the loading of nutrients and sediment in, in the bay up there. But once again, have we really learned? The Lossapuana River started flowing brown. You know, how brown? How much? Well, look at that. You can actually see the silt clear down into here, all the way back up the river. Now, why would we do that? You'd think we would learn from you know, the last hundred years that the best of the best going down into the ocean, into the river, is not the answer. That hurts. So then, we're going to look at 2020. Once again, I don't know if we're learning. So we had uh, the air cedar break down. We were, we were trying to plant. We are going after parts. And I looked up ahead, and there was a terrible, and it was windy. You know, we had 40, 50 mile an hour gusts that day. And I looked up, and I said, oh my gosh. Look at, and this, this, and this is a friend of mine, uh, a former legislator in the state of Oklahoma, had several, several quarters of land blowing that day. And as we drove closer, and Carson, my hired man that's with me, been with me 14 years, uh, kind of like my second son, he was sitting in the driver's seat, so I had him uh, start taking pictures. You know, Will Rogers said last year we said things didn't go on like this, and they didn't. They got worse. And I thought it was really funny. Here he is out here trying to stop things blowing with tillage that caused a problem. You know, he was trying. But I, th I think that's humorous. You know, that dang plow caused that thing to blow away. Let's go stop it. Let's plow. So we start driving closer and closer. I couldn't even see the edge of the road. That's kind of like my uncle when he got blind and old and, and, and he wouldn't give up driving. He's still driving. I said, Uncle Roy, how, how you drive? He said, well, I didn't, when I get the feeling that vibration, if it's on the right side, I know I'm on my side of the road. If it's on the left side, I know I'm over on the other side of the road. <laughs> so, okay, maybe that's what I need to do. Because here we are. You can't even see the road. It's like, holy cow. You know what had happened? He'd grown a sesame crop there the year before, didn't plant a cover crop. Sesame is like cotton and other things, it no residue. And then he planted a cotton crop in the spring. And it never rained. And it just blew and blew and blew. It's not the strongest of species that survived or the most intelligent. Ta -da! but the ones most responsive to change. Charles Darwin, you know, that guy's getting pretty old now. But he knew. Change is hard, though. The only way we change if it's easy. <coughs> Many civilizations have come and gone because they didn't understand their soil and they couldn't feed themselves. Just look at history. I went to Italy a few years ago. The Romans, one of the most sophisticated engineering societies I've ever saw. Built things, you wonder how in the world they built them and how they moved them, big pillars. What really finally got them was they kept spreading out these, degrading their land, they couldn't feed their people, they just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Whoops, that's what I was doing. I just kept getting bigger and bigger. Destroying more and destroying more. And then when the barbarians come, they were so spread out and the people were so fed up with them because they had no food and stuff, they were easily overthrown. The erosion rate, this is from NRCS. This goes up to 2015. There's new data out. I just don't have it on this. <clears throat> Tons per acre that's eroding away. Now we've got better. But how much better have we got? In billions of tons a year, we are the number one exporter of what? 
soil. The largest export we export out of our country, out of our fields, is soil. 1.69 billion. We hear a lot of billions nowadays. We should never hear about billions and trillions. But we're pretty good leaving our land. What does that really mean? So you take that tons of soil that's leaving, you divide that by 2 million pounds, and David, why would we do that? What's in the, in the top 6.7 inches of soil? Yeah, this thing called furrow slice. I didn't even know what that was until a few years ago. The cream of the crop, top 6.7 inches. So you take them furrow slices, and that is 70 million semis at 80 feet long of soil every year leaving, going down the river, down the stream. Guess how long that is. How would you like standing in the elevator line trying to unload a grain, a load of grain or a load of soil? Oh, well, you're just a billion behind. So what does that really mean for every man, woman, and child? So if we take that and divide that by the current population in the United States of 329 million, Five point one tons for every man, woman, and child. Folks, that, that's alarming to me. And it hurts me. We're better than that. And we can do a heck of a lot better than that. And I'm gonna show you what we can do. Now we have this thing called consumers that we sell our products to. And they keep growing and we keep getting smaller. In numbers, you know, they're starting to watch and listen. Whether we like it or not, they're starting to say we want better and we expect you to do better. So, you know, they want to know how their food is what? Grown. Is it healthy? Has it got chemicals in it? Has it got, you know, all this other stuff that you guys, they think we're just out here destroying it. And, and, Man, we're not. We're, we're trying to do the right thing. We really are. We just have not see the big, big picture. Here I am planting what I call originally a chaos garden. And Keith come up with this better word called milpa. I'm planting a garden right here. News 4 is out here doing a story with us. Not much dust falling up behind me here in the cover crop. But look what's happened in our meat supply. And it's got worse since 1991, I'll tell you. That's the reason Jimmy has this thing sticking out, is because when I eat, my body says, hmm, I need some more copper. I need some more iron. And Jimmy wants to eat more. You ever thought about that? Well, Look at vegetables. The same way. I listened to a speaker yesterday morning, a good friend of mine, Erin Martin. She's on fire. She, she's a gerontologist. What's that? She's got a degree in aging. Why do I want to talk to her? I'm getting older. Want to help me? You have to eat seven oranges now to get the same nutrients as you did out of one. 40 years ago. No matter how big the hammer is that you use, you can't pound common sense into stupid people. <laughs> I work for the government. <laughs> Secretary Purdue said, Jimmy, can you put common sense back in? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what we need. Uh, gosh, that's a, that's a huge challenge. <laughs> What's the difference between stupidity and the genius? Geniuses have their limits. <laughs> you know, I, I can be pretty stupid too myself. My dad used to say, son, if you don't learn, you're not going to live the very old. <laughs> so what can we do? That's a good thing. Here's the good part. This is what we can do. 27, uh, 2017 census in agriculture, <laughs> this is from Oklahoma. 
So I'm picking on myself. This is what we saw. The key points that when you look at the census was we decreased intensive tillage. That's mow board, rippers, chisels, intensive chill tillage by nearly 30%. We also increased farms using cover crops by 24%. Keith, how's the seed business been done? See, you started 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Yeah, and you went from zero to, woo, a big pile. Well, that's good. We're trying to help you out, by the way. 51% increase in the, the acres. We're seeing that all over. It's really growing. So what does that really mean? So I had this guy call me up, email me actually, named Drew Ewing. He's a graduate student at Clemson University. And you know that, that Clemson's not very close to Oklahoma. Anybody ever notice that? And he's like, he wants to come to my farm. Why would a grad student from Clemson want to come to my farm? So I called him. I said, Drew, got your email. Come on down. You're the next contestant. Come on down. I just said, I got, I'm real curious. Why are you interested in Emmons Farms? He said, well, I'm studying microbiology. And what I'm being taught is not what you're saying on YouTube. I've been watching you. I've been watching you, your presentations. And me and my dad want to come down after the Christmas break here and see if you know what you're doing or not. <laughs> i got news for you. I don't. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm trying. So he come down. And we, we went on a tour. And so we took him behind our house. And Keith's been there. And Russ has been there to a place we've been working on four or five years. I took him over uh, a mile away to a neighbor on the same elevation, the same soil type. And, and Darren is a, is a good friend of mine. He's an EMS. He's going to be a good friend with them in our area. I do stupid things once in a while. But he's a very intense tillage guy. He grazes everything that sticks up higher than his floor. And the county comes every year, two or three times a year. And, and takes all the donated soil off the road and out of the bar ditch so they can make room for more out of his place. I can't get him to look at what, what he's doing or what I'm doing. Then I took him to, to the place that had been longest in. We've been working on this now for 11 years. And when Drew left, he said, Jimmy, how can I help you? This is, this is crazy. He said, you got to talk to my professors. And I did. I've had great conversations with them. Uh, I could back up to that one slide about common sense, but I'm not going to, and I'm not going to say any more. <laughs> but I asked Drew, I said, in your own words, write down something that you saw today. And this is exactly what he wrote. The first land was upland rye planted in residue of grazed cover crop. Dark brown. Now, in Oklahoma, everybody thinks we got what color? Brunette. Yeah. Well, how come that's dark brown? Close to brunette brown for about the first five inches. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. With a marked change of red clay below. Hmm, there it is. Now I wonder why it's down there. But anyhow, the frost line, the ice crystal, this was in January, so we were froze. Frost line is about a quarter inch of soil, mainly on the surface. It held its structure, yet I was able to crumble it to the bottom three inches of the carbon rich soil in my hands it is 1029, January 2nd of 2019. It's the first field. Been working on how long? How long? Okay, you're paying attention. Five inches. If you're in a good system, and you're applying all the principles of soil health, we can see the carbon moving down about an inch a year if you're doing everything you can do. Give or take, because Mother Nature, when it doesn't rain, that slows down. When it rains, it speeds up, but on the average. So keep that in mind. Now we're going to go over to Darren's field, the neighbor. Compacted red clay. Hmm. Wonder why it's red over at his place and brown at my place. 
the characteristics of the region. He didn't have the chart that day to look at the color classification. It was tougher to get the sharpshooter in. Mr. Emmons was hopping with both legs and lots of force. That's, you know, there is good things about weight, you know. David Brandt says your planter won't go on the ground, set on it and ride on it. <laughs> Use natural. The frost layer was, was uh, uh, anyway, was inferred because when the shovel was lifted from the bottom, broke off about five to six inches down the ice crystals. It was froze five or six inches. And it was only a quarter inch where we was at just, and you know it's warmer over at my place. It never gets, you know, different. Red clay was frozen, difficult to break apart. It stuck to my hands once I broke it off, which was not observed in the first field, and my hands froze after a couple of minutes. Think about that. Now we're going to go another mile, two miles, down to the field I've been working on the longest. Bottom planted in residue of cover crops, the shovel went in with very little effort, mainly using my arms, pushing it in. Never reached the bottom of the carbon-rich soil. Soil color from memory was close to umber brown. Ice crystals shallower than the first field, an eighth inch. Maybe because we was down below the hill helped that to reduce this. Was able to crumble the entire column with my hands with little effort, and my hands stayed somewhat warm. Not frozen. Why is that? What was he seeing that day? So we're in a, looks like a, a gymnasium. And his dad said, Jimmy, he talks over my head. You talk over my head. Tell me in layman's terms what we saw today. And I said, sure, Mike. So the first field we went to, we're going to say that is a gymnasium. And we're going to have basketball practice. Coach showed up. The team showed up. It's kind of cool in here. But when we went to running and warming up and playing, what happened? It got warmer. Not hot. Well, it did if you had to run the bleachers. I run several figure eight it's on the bleachers when you're not doing what you're supposed to. I said when we went to the neighbors, that gym was in the middle of January. It was cold. There was no one in it. They, hadn't, they don't have the heat turned on. And it was cold. The last field we went to, they were having a tournament. The fire marshal's at the door and he said no one else can come in. And what did they have to do? They had to turn the fan on because it got hot. If you have biology in the soil, it will work all winter because in the gym, when they're working, they create heat just like we do. They put carbon in the soil. So I'm putting back what we took out. Consumers should be concerned. They should be watching and caring. I agree. Because now I kind of like to know how the producers are farming. Are we letting the CO2 go up and the water go up? Little did I know when I was plowing that a half inch, at least a half inch every time I plowed was going My most limiting factor in Lady Oklahoma is what? Water. And what I want to do? I want to plow it out or divert it out of the field. When I should be putting CO2 and carbon and water in the, in the soil. And how do I do that? In 2011, when we started this, I could only put a half inch irrigation pass on why? Because it wouldn't go in. It was running out of the field or ponding if I put more than that on. But that's no problem. I can just go around, around, and around. It's fine. But in 2012, I started this crazy thing in our area of trying to grow warm season cover crops behind wheat. By the way, Keith, that's some of your seed. That's our first mix. We've learned a lot since then. Then, here we 
are, this is a year ago. <clears throat> I've stopped the pivot, I parked it, turned it on, and I put seven inches on less than two hours. And when I went to shut the pivot off, I noticed there was no standing water, no running off water. The water infiltrated, and the NRCS was out helping me do this, had infiltrated five foot deep. Now, you gotta consider, we've done this the week, two weeks prior, so now I've done put another seven on, but I'm also got corn, and I'm gonna show you these pictures. So in, in two weeks, I put over 17 inches on, and it was all gone in 20 minutes. Here's what we done. We parked the pivot. I got this huge four foot ring made. Put a rain gauge, put a camera here and a camera here, and we're gonna watch what happens. Now remember, when I started, I could only put a half inch on, and I put seven inches, and if you could really, you can't really see it, but the gauge, it's, it's at six inches right now. See anything standing? There's a little bit standing right here at the end of the pivot where the end gun, I had it turned off, but it was dripping down. You see this water right here? And there's a little puddle right here standing. NRCS said, how in the world are we gonna get the pickup out of the field? I said, drive forward. My structure's good enough now, no problem. But the amazing thing that we found that day when we went to looking, and then, once again, you have to kind of look here a little bit. There's a funny little thing going across there. This is my state soil scientist, been with me all this time. Also my partner at the Conservation Commission, she's a soil scientist as well. And so to help you out, we'll zoom in a little closer. This is what it used to look like. This is what it looks like now. This is the layer of carbon that's moving down an inch a year. We're putting it back. It can be done. So, that day, guess what? My NRCS guy said, oh my gosh, Jimmy, we can reclassify your soil. What? What does that mean? Never heard of that. He said it doesn't happen very often. Matter of fact, there's only two guys in the country that we've talked about. David Brandt changed his soil. So what does that really mean? The original soil survey mapped the soil as a used to flu vent. They were very young soils, about 500 years old. Typically didn't have a very dark surface. And that, I did not see that eight years ago. But today, I see a dark soil we can now call a mollic, which now needs to be reclassified as a fluventic heptasoil. And actually, we're two numbers darker than we need to be to, to classify that. So, there's more to the pie than just the crust. I like the sweet stuff in the middle myself. What does that mean? How important is soil aggregation to soil health? Anybody know what aggregation is? Okay, it's the size of the soil particle. When you're destroying it with tillage and, and bad practices, it keeps getting smaller, smaller, smaller. And what does that do? It, it closes the soil up. And what does that do? It keeps water from going in, oxygen, gas flow going in, because Believe it or not, the biology is just like us. They've got to breathe in and out. They have to have oxygen. They exhale CO2 and water vapor. But if you seal it off, they can't live. It's everything, beginning with water infiltration, water holding capacity, carbon storage, and nutrients. The more organic matter you got, the more nutrients you have. Because if we can take in an eight to 10 inch rainfall event, or at least most of it, it provides multiple benefits. Future water to grow crops, which I need, nutrients stay in the field instead of going downstream, and our soil stays in place. So, can we control runoff with organic matter? Yeah, we can. 
friend of mine, and I'll just tell you who it is here in a minute, done this. 2% organic matter will hold about 32,000 gallons. Give or take, depending on where you're at, your soil classification, there's several different factors, but where he was at, this is what he thinks is about right. So that means 21% uh, of a moderate heavy rainfall he can take in. Well, that sounds pretty good. Other than 80% is leaving. Because he can't go in. So if your most limiting factor is water, that's not very good. So what can we do if we raise that to 5%? Huh, we can hold 80,000 gallons. What does that mean? Now you can hold 50, a little over half what you get. So instead of 80% leaving, now we can keep half of it. So if it rained eight inches, well, we get to keep four. But what happens if you can go to 8%? Now you can hold 128,000 gallons. Or 85% of the big rain. Only leaving 20 now. That's pretty powerful if you're in that flood event. Now, can you hold it all? Not in a big flood. You're not going to get it all. But why not get all we can get? Because we're going to need it down the road. And, you know, we're kind of dry now. It'd be kind of nice to have some. <coughs> Dr. Alan Williams is the one that done that in 2016. This is a good friend of mine in uh, North Dakota, Jeremy Wilson. I think, Keith, you may know Jeremy. It rained all day. 14 inches, one little shower. And why is that not playing? Hey, Brittany, could you click play on that for me? It's supposed to play it automatically. But I want you to look while she's doing that, how clear the water is. Tell me it's going to play. We're going to break. We're going to blame Brittany on that. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> well, so it rained all day and hail half the day. So water's leaving his field. It did sweep away some of the residue. And you can see some of the residue and the roots still hanging on here in this picture, which did would play. But there's no ditch there. And there's no soil leaving the field. And he actually takes his hand, scoops up some water, and takes a drink out of it. 14 inches. Once again, he didn't, he, he, his profile's full. And it's leaving. But nothing's leaving with it. A little bit of residue in this low area left. But no soil. Now that's that's not normally the norm. Jeremy's a Leopold winner. He's, he knows how to do it now. In my soil scientist's 30 year career, he hasn't seen this kind of change very often. Only when a producer goes into a soil health management system. The complete system. So living on the land or the land living on you. What does that mean? Right now, if you're trying to buy fertilizer and chemicals, you could be in the bottom column because it's not cheap at all, even remotely close. And if, if I told you, say, nitrogen fertilizer is $1,000 a ton, what if I told you that it's actually $2,000 or $3,000 a ton? Do you realize that we're only at the very best day that we have 50% efficient with our nitrogen fertilizer? Worldwide, it's 33%. So you're paying $1,000 a ton, but you're only getting 30% or 50%. Woo! Not very good. This is a double crop corn. I'm going to show you that we planted behind harvested cereal rye, which a lot of people will tell you can't be done. 
But we'll see how that went. My question that day to Steve was, what are you seeing here? He said, we are seeing plants taking up ammonium and amino acids so they have more energy to grow instead of breaking down synthetic fertilizer. And this is what that corn looked like. No fertilizer, no nutrients. And that's in that field along the stem. We also have crabgrass, whoop, wrong button. Cereal rye growing down here because when I harvested the rye, even though I was selling it to Keith, I want to keep a little bit, so I just threw some over at the combine. Pretty easy. Just got to drive a little faster. Everybody said, why would you want to do that? Well, why do I want to pull the drill? I can't run both. Let's go scroll a little over. It worked very well. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in the moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. Anybody want to talk about today's times? Very challenging, very controversial. Need to think about that. So the state of our soul today, in Jimmy Emmons' terms, I think we're about a C minus. Because we have done better. When the winds blew 100 miles an hour in Colorado and Kansas, the entire nation didn't blow away. So we're better. Still not where we need to be, but you know, in high school I would say, well, I'm making it. Shot don't kick me out, and I won't stand out of here. So I think we're doing okay. Lots to be done. How many of you like Western movies? How many of you like John Wayne? I love John Wayne. Have you ever saw John Wayne, especially in his early movies, when he's younger, more fit? Have you ever stopped, seen him stop a runway stagecoach? This is how he done it. He jumped from A to B to C to D to E to F. Got the lead horse, woo, pulled it up. Saved the day. But I wonder if there's another way. <laughs> you ever think that John Wayne and John Ford sat around at the end of the day having a bourbon, and they'd done that quite a bit, and a cigar, and John Ford, the director, would said, hey, Duke, tomorrow you're getting a little older and a little heavier. Instead of risking losing you, won't you just do plan B? No, they never even thought of it. That's my point today. We need to be thinking of plan B. What can we do? Do it the old way that we all grew up on doing exactly what we love to do with the people that we love? Or is there another way? And I'm not saying kill the animals. I'm just saying there is another way because sometimes we're carrying the answer with us here, but we're just not looking in the right places to solve the solution. So, we just do nothing? We've been pretty good at that. And why do we just do nothing? It's impossible. I can't plant the residue that's cab high. Yeah, we can. Because we got technology. We got a drill that will plant right here. My air seeder, Carson sometimes gets a little carried away. He gets out in the gravel road. I was coming by there the other day in a drought. Guess where I can row the wheat the best? <laughs> in the road. Don't like him to do that. But. Or just do it. Nothing's impossible. I think that's pretty good. Long live the soil is what I say. I've trademarked that because it better. And it will. Because it always has. But we were left here to take care of this for the Creator. 
Remember, he gives us dominion. That doesn't mean we rule it. That means we foster it and take care of it. Soil health is so good at Evans Farms. I can grow plants on a corner post. <laughs> Once again, if you think you need to plow, plant a seed, maybe you don't have to. I've seen trees growing out of rocks. I drove by this for several weeks every day. Oh, man, that's kind of cool. And one day, it's like, I can put that in presentation. <laughs> now, did it, did it live? No, but it, it will now because that corner post get more rock, so I think the next seed will come up and it'll grow right down through it. I don't have it all figured out. And I'm no, they call me an expert at the meeting uh, last week. That's the stop. Like, whoa, 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 I am not the expert. I do have a briefcase and I am over 100 miles from home, but <laughs> we're still figuring it out. And there's a lot of work to be done. And by far, I'm not the best. But you're going to hear from Keith about how the system really works. And I think it will help you understand what I've talked about this morning and bring it all together. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot.